Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to today's show. This is Jason Hartman, your host. And as you may or may not know, every 10th show, we kind of do a special tradition here that originated with my Creating Wealth show, where we do a topic that is actually off topic on purpose, something just to do with general life and more successful living. And that's exactly what we're going to do today with our special guest. Again, 10th show is off topic, and it is very much intentional just for personal enrichment and I hope you enjoy today's show. And we will be back with our guest in just a moment. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com. Or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Dr. David Rock to the show. He is the author of Your Brain at Work, Strategies for Overcoming Distraction, Regaining Focus, and Working Smarter All Day Long. I know this is a topic we can all benefit from, especially yours truly, so I think this will be an interesting interview. David is co-founder and director of the Neuroleadership Institute, and they are all about breaking new ground in our capacity to improve thinking and performance, and he is also founder and CEO of Results Coaching Systems. David, welcome. How are you? Very good. Thanks very much for your interest in my work. Good. And you're coming to us from New York City, right? I am. I'm in uh, lovely downtown Manhattan, where I live. And uh, I'm originally Australian, but I live uh, in New York City. It's a great city. We would have never guessed that from your accent. Just kidding. (laughs) Fantastic accent. So, David, tell us a little bit about how we can be more effective. I mean, everybody, especially in today's world, is constantly plagued by distractions, complexities, and it's tough to focus nowadays with looking at multiple computer screens, and then you've got your digital handheld device near you, probably, and plus the people in the room. There's a a lot going on. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, our our brain is really... um very, very different to how uh, the kind of the people who, who, who organize companies would like it to be. <laughs> um, our brain is, is not, the, not the brain that uh, sort of interior designers think it is. We, we cannot focus with just, you know, a few people looking at us, never mind bouncing screens. You know, we can't focus very well at all if, there's, if we're aware people are watching us. We can't focus very well if there's just a, a printer icon, you know, flashing on our screen. It's very, very easy to distract um, people from, especially from a, a train of thought that is kind of conceptual. You know, when you when you when something's right in front of you, you can think about it, you can talk about it. When something's conceptual, like it's in the future or you haven't seen it before, it's a concept like a interest rate or a new product or a new hire or a, concepts don't fit very well in the brain. So they take a lot of effort to hold and they're very easily displaced because they take so much effort. So. It's, it's very, very difficult to focus on the kind of conceptual work we're all doing uh, with any kind of distraction. And the truth is, the truth is, you know, companies are making some, some shocking mistakes with how they just, you know, physically lay out and organize kind of spaces. Very um, interesting. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so you're saying, well, I just wanted to touch on the concept point that you made, because I'm, I'm not sure people understand what you mean by, by concept. So you mean, as opposed to task-oriented thinking, that's much simpler, whereas conceptual thinking, our brains need to put multiple parts together and project them into the future, and that's much more taxing on the brain. Is that what you're saying? Well, it's more like this. You know, if I say to you, um, picture your mother 
she's uh, going to come to mind pretty easily. And, and if I ask you questions about your relationship with your mother, you, you know, you can think about that easily. If I say picture your car, you can picture that pretty easily uh, or picture an elephant. You know, you can picture that pretty easily. But if, if I say, you know, picture um, where you'll be in three months time. That's much or, harder or picture, to picture, right? right? It's much harder. It's a concept. It's, it's not a physical object in the world. And when we, when, we, when we process any kind of information, we have to hold it in mind. And holding something in mind has uh, essentially two parts. It's, it's called working memory. It has two parts. There's, a, there's an audio and a visual part, basically. Visual, the visual working memory is dramatically more robust. There's a lot more circuitry involved. And you can hold a lot more information in a picture than you can in a sound. And so, so our visual circuitry is really strong, but when you can't picture something easily, you don't have a robust circuit. And so it takes a lot of effort uh, to, to hold that circuit in mind. You know, say to you, picture where you'll be in three months and then, you know, a phone rings next to you and you've suddenly lost your train of thought. You're much more likely to lose that train of thought than if I say, you know, picture your car, you'll be able to hold that train of thought through the distraction. And it's, it's, it's the level of effort involved in holding a circuit together so essentially, we're, we're dealing in concepts these days. You know, very few people sell physical, sell or, or, or sort of, you know, pick up and move or deal with physical objects in the world so much. We're dealing with concepts. Right, and, services um, and, and things like that. Right, yeah, that's a good exactly, point. Exactly, good point. exactly, yeah. things we don't see. So it's much harder to process all that. So it's interesting. And I, Well, first, maybe you can tell us about, when you talk about how workspace is laid out for people, what mistakes do you see individuals and companies making as, in terms of how they lay out their workspace? What keeps them from being focused? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an excellent question. We did a survey recently with a, an organization, and we got 6,000 employees to respond to a set of questions about physical space. But, but the, the, the biggest insight came from the sort of overarching question. And we, we asked people, you know, how, how many of you do your best thinking at work? And just to bear in mind, this is in the company, I won't say who, who it is, but it's in a company where people are, you know, really paid to think. So they go to work, they're supposed to be thinking. So, so literally in the place where they're supposed to be doing their work, I've asked them the question, how many of you actually can do quality work at that place? And the, the answer was 10%. So one in 10 people could, you know, actually find going to work was a good place to get work done. That's crazy, right? Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Bad odds. It's insane. Yeah. I mean, you should just close the office and let people come in one, every, one in every 10 days, perhaps, or, or one in every 10 people should come in. I don't know what, but, but it's crazy when you think about it. So, so we, we, I, I wrote a blog called, uh, or a post called, how, how Companies Spend Big Dollars Making People Less Effective. And... There's a lot of organizations that really don't understand the, just the basic nature of human functioning and do some crazy things. Now, Steve Jobs has been in the media a lot lately, and, and he's, a, you know, he's a, an amazing man for many, many reasons. But one of the things that he has not talked about much is he was an observer of human nature. He was a, a, a meditator and um, into all sorts of kind of spiritual things. But what he was ultimately about was observing human nature. And he was very successful at, at noticing quirks that other people didn't notice, such as, uh, you know, people like things really simple. People don't want to have to think. You know, we like stuff to be, you know, intuitive and, and, and natural. Now, certainly there are boffins around, but, but, you know, he observed human functioning. Now, if you go into an office and observe human behavior, what you'll see is in any kind of office that's even vaguely open plan, you'll see everyone with their headsets in trying to shut out the world so they can focus. <laughs> and if you ask people sort of, if, and if you observe across a day, you'll notice that people are doing a couple of hours of sort of really good work in the morning and then that's pretty much it for the day. So there are pretty obvious patterns that, you know, we need to be able to shut the world out and we can only really do good quality work for a few hours a day in the mornings. So it, it sort of, you know, it starts to have you question, well, how should we design companies physically if, if that's the way uh, the human brain functions? And the answer is, you know, we should not schedule meetings and not be answering emails in the morning. Uh, in the mornings, we should be leaving that time for creative work and actually producing things. And we should use the afternoons for meetings to, you know, help each other stay awake. Uh, and we should uh, also allow people the, the physical space to be absolutely totally undisturbed by anything and, and be able to sort of move through, you know, ha have that option to be totally, totally undisturbed.
You know, that, that's um, interesting so because, are, because you know, pe people, I, I mean, most people, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I think most people, the first thing they sort of do when they start their day is they manage all their email. And that's pretty task oriented, though. I guess it requires, you know, sometimes the emails, you, you need to respond in a creative fashion or think about what someone sent you, of course. But maybe that's not the highest and best use for that prime time of our, our brain power, right? Absolutely. I mean, the, the golden rule is do creative work first, urgent and important second, and email and everything else third. And, and the reason is a bit complex, but essentially creative work or, uh, is, requires a lot of um, space in your brain. It requires a lot of quiet in your brain. You know, we have insights when our brain is quiet, when we can notal, notice um, subtle connections between things, weak connections between things. And so, so you know, we, doing um, you know, emails is sort of like doing, you know, 50 push-ups. Um, and you've, you, you've only, you know, in, in terms of mentally, and you're actually, you know, absolutely exhausted afterwards. Um, and then you go to do you know, so, some other exercise and you, you haven't got much left in you. Creative work first, urgent, important second, and everything else after. So most people need to flip their day around, I'd assume, listening to this. What about the, the physical space? You know, I assume you're going to say keep it a s sort of simple, zen-like environment, not a lot of things to look at maybe, or, or no. You know, I mean, I see a lot of workspaces of companies that seem to be pretty effective and they, they seem like they have whiteboards all over some of them paint them on the walls there's writing all over them everything's kind of like you know there's that sort of war room type concept of the environment where it's like a war room and you've just got bulletin boards up things stuck up on the walls a lot of stuff to look at storyboarding whatever and then there's the the decorated type of office where it's maybe clean and simple and nicely decorated is is one more right than the other or, or by what you're saying it would seem like the war room is a really bad idea well you know it depends on the kind of work you're trying to do and little things actually matter um, more than we realize when it comes to, to physical space and and just the brain overall you know really little things really do matter it turns out so the you know for example if you paint a room blue people will be much more creative um, a high ceiling makes people much more creative you know, there's a lot of little things like that actually help. They prime the brain. You know, I saw a study today which showed that just changing rooms, you know, when you move rooms, it's much harder to access memories that, that you formed in the previous room. There's all sorts of kind of quirky things that, that, that go on. But essentially, if you're looking for, uh, you know, one size fits all, the, the, the best answer I can give you is let people design their own space. And there's a great study showing you get about a third increase in productivity when you let people design their own workspace, which is crazy. Uh, and the companies say, well, let's design it for them. Let's find you know, one approach. But a third increase in productivity, that's quite a lot, 30%, 33%. Literally just, you know, okay, how do you want your space to look? Just personalize it. And some people really need it clean and absolutely zen. Some people want their family everywhere on the walls. Some people want five desks and a war room thing. And, you know, every brain's really different. Um, and giving people the autonomy to make these kind of choices um, actually is a reward unto itself. But, but people have different needs when it comes to that physical space as well. So the, the best rule is don't have one, <laughs> is let people create the spaces themselves. But but that's interesting what you said about blue. I mean, there have been a lot of studies that I've heard about that show that like pink is the color of calmness and they're painting prisons where there's a bunch of hardened criminals. You know, they're painting the insides of them pink in many cases to calm everybody down so they're not violent, <laughs> you know. But but is blue you know the what? color they're not of violent. They're, they're, they, I'm trying to imagine the criminals. They're not violent, but they're deeply embarrassed probably. Right, well, maybe. <laughs> imagine going to jail. <laughs> Imagine going to jail and, and, and having to stay in a pink cell. You'd be you'd be you'd, you'd be too embarrassed to, to be to be violent. That's funny. There you um, go. Well, but you know, but, but a, is is blue is blue the color of creativity though? It is. Yeah. It, oh, it, 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 it's it's uh, partly to do with the proximity proximity effects. You know, when you feel like you can see at a distance, and you feel like you can see a long way, and you're not you you, you actually it's weird, but it primes your brain to think literally big thoughts. You know, when you're looking at the sky rather than a roof.
your your brain is able to sort of think further out, think bigger thoughts, think more systemically. It primes your brain. I think I think a lot of people listening may want to paint, get some blue paint. So just before we leave this small little subject here that seems really important, is there a certain shade of blue? Is it sky blue? Is that the right color or navy or? I I I, I don't want to be too prescriptive. I think okay. people right. do their own research on that. Okay. But, it's, <laughs> it's, but the, you know, some something that is pleasing to the eye is of course really important. And that may vary. Sure, sure. What are some of the things people can do to to find insights and and solve seemingly insurmountable problems? The problem that just that there's no seemingly right solution. How, how does one get their mind in a place where they can solve these types of problems? The the answer to that is is really fascinating and confounding. I mean the the, the um. There's really two brains. We've really got two brains. We've got a conscious brain and a non-conscious brain. And it's being talked about by a lot of people, lots of different frameworks, uh, you know, the elephant and the rider and the high road and the low road, all sorts of things. But essentially, we have a, a conscious brain and a non-conscious brain. And, uh, you know, when we can't solve a problem, the conscious brain goes round and round in circles on the same small set of solutions. We kind of get stuck in the same small set of solutions and, and, and not get anywhere. And, the, what's really interesting is those those breakthrough moments when we suddenly have this kind of aha. And it's something I've studied a lot for about five years. We we know a lot now about these breakthrough moments. They actually happen when the brain is quiet and when we're not consciously trying to solve the problem. We've we've got to have sort of thought about the question, but trying to consciously solve a problem once we've failed it a- actually is going to reduce the likelihood of insight, interestingly. So what we know is um, quieting the brain, going a little bit internal, being slightly happy, but not working directly on the problem, working around it. This is the kind of state we need to be in to solve these tough problems. I wrote a, I wrote a paper about this, but if you look up online just how to have more insights, you'll see my post on Psychology Today on that, how to have more insights. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we really know a lot now about the neural state of a brain that has, has these breakthroughs. And there's, there's no substitute for quiet in the brain. And quiet literally means not a lot of electrical activity going on. So it's that state you have in the shower in the morning when you first wake up, but you won't have that if you do your emails before the shower. You know, your, your brain will be ticking over. So it's that quiet brain. That's when we have those breakthrough moments and kind of respecting those quiet spaces in the day and allowing the insights to come from the non-conscious brain into the conscious brain. That's how we tend to solve those tough problems. Yeah, very good point. How can we be more effective in collaborative situations where we really need to collaborate and harvest ideas from others and be inv- engaged in that exchange? You know, there's, a, there's a big body of work in this area. There's a, there's a whole field called social cognitive neuroscience, and there are a whole bunch of neuroscientists, probably about 500 of them now, uh, that are studying how people interact and what happens when we try to collaborate. And and uh, I, I built a model that summarizes um, what goes on in these in the collaborative situations, and it's been really really helpful for understanding kind of what goes wrong a lot of the time. And it's it, basically there are five domains that the brain is tracking all the time, and uh, with these five domains, we're really uh, we're really it, it's really important that we don't get a a threat response in any of these domains. For example, status is the first one. Uh, you know, when we feel like our status is going down, when we feel like it's getting worse, um, we react very, very intensely. And what the neuroscientists are finding is that something like a status threat or an autonomy threat or a, a threat to a sense of relatedness to someone or a fairness threat, uh, th- these threats actually are, are A, very, very strong, and B, they, they activate the, the, the brain's pain network. So, uh, you know, feeling like someone's attacking your status actually feels in the brain like someone's attacking you with a knife and, and you defend yourself accordingly. Um, you defend yourself very, very vigorously. And this, most of this goes on non-consciously. So the, the five domains are, are status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness. And those five spell out a framework called SCARF. Um, and SCARF, or in American it's uh, SCARF, uh, SCARF is uh, these, these five domains that, are, that either can be in a threat or be in a reward state. So you can have an increase in status that feels really motivating and it's, it's very, very motivating to feel better than other people. It's very, very motivating to increase your sense of certainty. It's very motivating to increase your sense of relatedness, etc. So, so these five domains are being played out in social situations and 
when things go wrong, it's usually one of these five that's uh, that's come kind of come unstuck without people being aware of it. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. So certainly then what you're saying is if you're leading a team, the simple old concepts of positive strokes, of complimenting and rewarding and all that kind of stuff, I mean, that's neurologically important is what you're saying. It's critical. It's critical. And the reason it's critical is that our conscious, you know, our conscious mind is really, really limited and not that, not that effective on many levels. And you know, anything we can do to increase our conscious capacity, our conscious processing capacity is, is helpful. Bear in mind that, that few people can even add up four single digits in their head. <laughs> you know, that, and that's not much information. If I say to you, what's 56 plus 79? You know, you could probably do it, but you'd rather not. And, and, and just, you know, adding up four digits is a threshold at which, you know, most people sort of can't do things or, or some can, but certainly most people don't want to. And so, so making things easy for people turns out to be very important because we've got so little processing power, particularly for new ideas. We can process existing thoughts, existing habits very easily, but new ideas take a lot of processing power and they get kind of shunted aside a lot, which is why, you know, change is hard as well. But, but you're saying make it easy, but is the brain like a muscle where it needs exercise and it atrophies if it doesn't exercise? I mean, do you want to challenge, don't you want to challenge the brain, play chess, do crossword puzzles, or, you know, whatever, music? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a use it or lose it thing. There's no question there's a use it, use it or lose it in the brain. It's not a muscle, but, but it's definitely, uh, you know, it's definitely something that most functions improve with use. You, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but in, in terms of when one feels their status is, is threatened, they become less effective. Does that lead into any more thoughts on keeping one's cool under pressure, under any situation? Yeah, I mean, the, the big takeaway from the brain research is that emotions do really, um, do really matter. And even low levels of, of, uh, of stress have a surprisingly large effect on our cognitive capability. And, you know, learning how to, to regulate your own emotions by, by recognizing them and being able to intervene quickly, whether it's distracting your attention or changing your interpretation of situations. You know, doing these things quickly is, is really, really key. And what, what we know is from neuroscience is that even really small threat responses, something primed, that people don't even know they feel. Really small threat responses actually reduce cognitive capacity in a big way, especially around creativity. You can get a 50% reduction in creativity with a threat response people don't even know they're feeling. And so, so small things really matter when it comes to, to effectiveness. I mentioned this earlier. This is one of the kind of big findings from big overall findings. It's, I guess it's a generalization, but we, we have less control over ourselves than others than we probably realize, but more influence, um, far more influence in, in little ways over ourselves and others, but far, far less control. You approach it from the angle of maybe a manager or a leader in leading a group, and it's important not to threaten one's status and, and things like that. But if someone needs to, say, get over something or forgive and forget or process emotions, I mean, can one do that? more quickly? I mean, is it true that one can, a lot of people say, you know, I need to just process these emotions and then I'll be over it. I mean, how does one do that? Is that really a, a thing people truly do at the neuroscientific level or is it just something they talk about? No, there's a process called reappraisal, which has been very well studied in, in the neuroscience lab. And reappraisal is where you, you change your whole meaning about a situation. Um, and we do it all the time, mostly we're not aware of it. But it's, it's a very, very important skill for dealing with strong uh, stress, stresses. It's really the only skill you can use for something that's quite stressful. Like you lose your job, you know, you might start spiraling down into a stress response that really, really, you know, affects your life, to depression, all sorts of things. But if you can reappraise, if you're able to reappraise the situation, you might be able to change that. You could reappraise it as, as an opportunity to decide, you know, what's really important, you know, for, for your career next, or an opportunity to get really healthy and connect to your family for a while, 
or an opportunity to downsize and simplify your life or you know something that's got to make sense to you but um, neuroscientists have been looking at what happens when we change our interpretation of the situation and, and, and a whole emotional response follows a whole biological response follows when we change an interpretation so it's pretty important stuff yeah, yeah, that's very good feedback. You talked at the, at the beginning about how difficult and how much brain power it takes to comprehend conceptual things. And I want to I want to tie this into, you know, a discussion about something that has been repackaged and rewrapped as recently as 4 years ago or so. And that is the law of attraction concept, the secret that's been around forever basically, but it it regained a lot of fame recently. And and what one has to do when they when they make a goal for themselves is they have to visualize something that they don't yet have. It has to be projected into the future, but they need to make it seem like it's real today so that it's sort of the subconscious mind can grasp it maybe. I mean, I'm kind of saying a lot of things here, so interrupt me when I'm wrong <laughs> or, or correct me. But is, is this why it's so hard to set and achieve goals is because one has to get their head around a concept that is, isn't is there yet. Like you said, it's grasping a concept. It takes a lot more power than a, a physical yeah. thing. That's partly it. And there's been some good study uh, studies on the fact that the more, more a goal is proximal or the more a goal feels close to you, you know, both physically and in time, the more motivated you are. There's been some, some people researching that. So, yeah, definitely, uh, you know, goals that are really in the future, intangible, it's hard to, to picture them. When we can't picture something, we don't have the emotional response to it as strong as when we can picture it. It's all very well. To, if I say the word lion, you, you're not going to get much of a response. But if you actually picture a lion sort of about to jump at you, uh, or we showed you a picture of that physically, a picture, um, you know, you'd get a biological response. So, you know, hearing something doesn't get a strong response. Seeing it really does, back to that, that first point. So, so visual. So when they when they say the concept of visualization, of course, you want to maybe quote unquote visualize a goal with as many senses as possible and as much sensory input as possible. But really, vision that is without a doubt our richest sense, right? Far beyond our our hearing and our our touch and everything else. It's visual is 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 the biggie, right? Absolutely. And, and people will say, oh, I'm a visual person or I'm an auditory person or you know, I've got this learning style. Learning styles has, has been debunked. There's no such thing as learning styles. There are definitely tendencies and people have preferences. Um, use an iPhone for a month and you've got a definite tendency to prefer using iPhones. You know, it's just a habit that you've got. But it doesn't mean you've got an iPhone style brain. So something you do over and over will become a bit of a tendency. But in the brain, there, there are two ways of processing data, you know, audio and visual. That's what we have. Um, and the, the, the visual just holds so much more information. And in the brain, it's, it's, it's a huge amount more real estate. It's like, uh, it's like an enormous shopping mall versus a single store in terms of kind of square footage. So, you know, the visual is a huge shopping mall and the auditory is a single store. So, so there's a lot more connections you can make, a lot more neurons involved, a lot more circuits created when you, you hold visual than when you... Uh, than when you hold a sound. That, that, that's interesting, and I, I want to believe in every way that that's absolutely correct. The only area that I'd sort of question is the power of music being so powerful. And, you know, that's that's auditory, so it's kind of interesting. But yeah, I, guess, an impact. I, I guess the best songs, yeah. though, make people visualize stuff. Well, that's true as well. I mean, it's not to say that, vision, that sounds aren't, aren't effective. I mean, I could, I could play you all sorts of sounds in the lab that would make your hair curl. I mean, you know, the sound of a, of a of fingernails on a chalkboard uh, will will definitely have an emotional impact on people. <laughs> so there are, there are visuals that are impactful and there are sounds that are impactful. Can't so much compare them, but uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the strength of a circuit, it's just the physical real estate is much much stronger. So I think the you know we've got with goals. Um, there's a number of challenges with goals. One is we often can't see them and we don't sort of they, they're too often the distance. And another challenge is we often set goals in a negative way. We set um, avoidance goals instead of approach goals. And we need to really learn to set approach goals that we go towards rather than away from. Yeah, very good point. couple last things here before we wrap up. Providing feedback to people. That can be difficult. And 
trying, and maybe it's not possible at all, I don't know what you're going to say, but is it possible or can we be more effective at changing other people's behavior? So feedback and changing other people's behavior. I, you know, especially I think bosses and parents are going to want to <laughs> perk up at those two. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we all want to tell people how to fix themselves, and it's a great way of creating a status threat <laughs> and right. you know, having people sh- shut down. You know, my framework for feedback is, is actually don't give feedback unless it's positive. Give self-directed feed forward, which is, is help people give themselves feedback about the way forward. And it's just a much more effective way of creating behavior change than, than you know, telling people what they've done wrong. Can you give an example of that? That was a really interesting statement. You yeah, made. sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you go to a sales meeting with someone, you know, you're managing a salesperson, you go to the sales meeting and uh, they haven't done so great. And you come out afterwards and you start telling them all the things they'll do wrong and they'll argue with you and uh, will feel really bad or whatever. But instead of that, you can give self-directed feed forward, which is you can say to the person, you know, if you were doing that again, you know, you're a smart person, you probably learn a lot uh, all the time. If you're going to do that again, what would you do differently next time? What, uh, what learning did you take out of that? And by giving people a chance to kind of tell on themselves around this, you get a whole different set of circuits created and it's a reward response instead of a threat response. So it's, it's, uh, it's a different, you know, it's a qualitatively different experience to, to do self-directed feed forward than feedback. One creates a threat and shuts people down. One creates a reward and, and hopefully creates new connections. And it doesn't mean it works every time, but we find about three quarters of the time this approach works, which means you know, you got a lot less, it means you've got 25% as many arguments <laughs> as happens now. Very good point. So the book is entitled Your Brain at Work, Strategies for Overcoming Distraction, Regaining Focus, and Working Smarter All Day Long. David, tell people where they can learn more. Um, neuroleadership.com. Neuroleadership.com has uh, the programs that I offer on the brain and coaching programs, learning to be a certified coach and work we do with organizations. And neuroleadership.org. Neuroleadership.org has uh, a whole range of programs um, for individuals to discover the brain as change agents. So there's a postgraduate certificate, master's degree, things like that. There's also an annual summit that we run at neuroleadership.org. So a couple of different sites, the academic and research side, neuroleadership.org, neuroleadership.com, more the commercial side and organizational work. And then my own site, davidrock.net, um, for all the papers that I've written and books I've published, etc. So there's a few resources for you there to, uh, to enjoy. Fantastic. Dr. David Rock, thank you so much for joining us today. Appreciate having you on the show. Thanks so much for your interest in, uh, in this work. All the best. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.